Colossians 1, 15 through 18 is our passage of study this morning. It's one of the most brilliant and beautiful passages. At the same time, it has much deep mystery in it that Paul has written concerning the person and dignity of Jesus Christ. And as you approach it, you almost get the sense that you are approaching holy ground and take off your shoes. Because here he gives us one of the most beautiful descriptions of the Godhood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's important to remember also that it was written to a particular situation, to particular people who had problems pertaining to the spiritual world per se. But here we have Paul's focus upon the dignity and the deity of Jesus Christ. So Colossians 1 15 through 18 is the passage of our instruction this morning. Now, before we look at that at length, we'll notice some things regarding what I call the background, and we'll also notice the theme. Some of it going to be a recap of what we talked about last week in brief. Pertaining to the background of it, many people ask the question or make the suggestion, well, I don't need to know the background in order to understand the great teaching regarding the person of Jesus Christ that we find in this passage. And I don't necessarily need to know the background to the Colossian letter and what the situation was in the Lycus Valley in Phrygia, that would be in Asia Minor, today Turkey. I don't need to know that in order to know the ethical instructions that Paul gives us at the end of the letter. Now all of that is true. However, there are a couple of things that I want to add for your consideration. Number one, it's important to see the background because it helps us to be able to apply it to like situations today. In other words, when we understand what's taking place in that world of paganism and Judaism in Asia, and we're able to see what exactly is occurring, then we're able to also make application more readily to ourselves today and what's occurring in our world. And our mind automatically runs to passages such as Colossians 1 or Colossians 2 when we find such teachings as New Ageism in our world today. So it helps us in making a context in our world to note the context of that world. But there's something else also, and that is it helps us to know the background because we're able to determine why it is that Paul makes the phrases or utilizes the terminology that he uses in the text. In other words, many of the phrases that Paul uses, the words that he utilizes, are actually uh, peculiar to us. They're puzzling. Why would he add this particular statement in here? Why would he make this comment in here like this? For example, you have the word mystery used four times in the book of Colossians. Why does he use the word mystery? four times in Colossians. He uses the word wisdom six times in the book of Colossians. Why use the word wisdom six times? Not only so, but we have colored phrases such as the powers of darkness, chapter 1, verse 13. You have the principalities and the powers, chapter 2, verse 9. What are the principalities and the powers? And what exactly does Paul have in mind when he tells us that Christ is ahead of all principality and power? And then you have that he leads in triumph the principalities and the powers, verse 15. So why would he add that to Christ's success at the cross in this context of, Col of Colossians? And the answer is found when we are able to understand a little bit about the background of what is occurring in the ancient world and why Paul felt impelled to write to them and give us this great, fantastic, magnificent statement regarding the deity of Jesus Christ in verses 15 through 18. And why he uses these phrases and why he addresses himself as he does to the Colossians. So with that in mind, let's think about the background from only two verses as a recap. I look at verse 8 of chapter 2 and verse 18 of chapter 2. So glance at those two particular verses, chapter 2 verse 8, and then we'll go down to chapter 2 verse 18. Chapter 2 verse 8, take heed lest anyone make spoil of you, that is enslave you, through his philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the now here's that word, rudiments of the world and not after Christ. What are the rudiments of the world? 
We looked at it last week. The word rudiments can refer to many different things depending upon the context in which the word is utilized. But here it refers to the elemental cosmic powers that the Colossian people or the people in Asia were addicted that is, cosmic spiritual powers, elemental spirits that they relied on in their spiritual growth. Now, this was paganism, and that had impacted the church there. So that's verse 8, and that's the idea that we have, and your translation might even have some things about elemental spiritual powers of some sort in verse 8. Instead of the word rudiments, I use the American Standard Version, 1901 edition, and it gives the word rudiments. But that's the explanation of that. Now let's go down to verse 18. This will back up a little bit what we've just mentioned. Let no man rob you of your prize by a voluntary humility, worshiping or veneration of the angels. Then he has this interesting comment. Dwelling in the things which he has seen. The things which he has seen are the visions. That is relying upon visions. But this word dwelling... We looked at that word at length last week, but the word dwelling here in the Greek is embatuo, which refers to the initiatory rites coming into the mystery religions. As a matter of fact, just kind of taking a sidetrack for a moment, a century and a half ago, there was an English skeptic. His name was Sir William Ramsey. Sir William Ramsey read the New Testament. Particularly, he was interested in the book of Acts. And he, he was skeptical, as mentioned, regarding the New Testament, didn't believe in Christ. But he said, you know, I want to go over and I want to do research in archaeology and do some archaeological digs in Asia. So he did that. That would be Asia Minor. So he did that, and he came away, and he was specifically looking at the book of Acts that Luke wrote. And the more that he studied, the more he unearthed, the more he was amazed that Luke was so exceedingly accurate in everything that he said, getting down to even statements that are made pertaining to the change of offices and the change of terminology that is used for those officials on a year-by-year -year basis. He said, it's absolutely stunning. And he became, came away from that, one of the staunchest believers, Christians, in that century. As a matter of fact, when I was at school, one one. Professor told me, so well, Sir William Ramsey, he just goes overboard in supporting the inspiration of the text. I said, that's why I like him. <laughs> that's why I like the man, Sir William Ramsey. So one of the things that Ramsey discovered was that when he was looking at a temple in Kleros, K-L-A-R-O-S, in Asia, it was the Temple of Apollo. And he found inscribed there the word imbatuo, the same word that is right here, dwelling in the things that he has seen, in Batu dwelling. And it refers to, and he found out through more archaeological research, it referred to the initiatory rites that a person had to pass through in order to be a part of a mystery religion. And from that time to this day, so much more archaeological research has been uncovered showing that this is exactly the idea, the initiatory rites. So 2 and 18. Let no man rob you of your prize by a voluntary humility, worshiping of, of the angels, dwelling in, that is, involved in the initiatory rites by the visions that he has seen. And that's the idea. Now, we can see the application today immediately. Many people rely upon more what they feel, more upon what they have seen, more of the dreams they've had, than what the Word of God actually teaches. Well... That's exactly the problem that they were having at Colossae also. And they were involved in these mystery religions. So that being the case, let's summarize what we have here. Number one, they were afraid of the powers of darkness. We saw that in chapter 1, verse 13. Afraid of the powers of darkness. And they would use magical incantations and rites, amulets, in order to protect themselves from these dark forces that are in the world. So that would be number one. Number two, they were involved also in these temple worship, in the mystery religions in which they had these initiatory rites, and they had relied upon the visions that they themselves had. That was the idea that they were following at the territory, in the territory of Phrygia. That would be the political state in which Colossae was located. Remember that there are three communities there, all three of those to which rites, 
there's Colossae, there's Hierapolis, and there's Laodicea. All three of them right there in the Lycus Valley. And Epaphras, who's a preacher there, has come to Paul to, to Rome when Paul's in prison, tells him about what's going on. And so that's what's happening. So with that in mind, let's look once more at the thematic statement that is given to the book of Colossians. We find it in chapter 2 and verses 2 and 3. Let's just pick up the read, uh, chapter 2 and verse 1. Paul tells us very plainly, he says, I would have you know how greatly I strive for you, and I take it that he's referring to prayer. I would have you know how greatly I strive for you and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be comforted, they being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding. Now here it is. That they may know the mystery of God, even Christ. Here's the mystery you need to be interested in. Christ, in whom are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge hidden. One need not go off anywhere else. For the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, we have it right here in Christ. And so that's the thematic statement that Paul gives us in chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. So with that in mind, let's now look at the passage that we really want to think about. And that is chapter 1, verses 15 to 18. And I simply think of it as simply showing us the supremacy, the lordship, the deity of Jesus Christ. Really, truly, one of those magnificent statements that Paul has put together in his entire corpus, that is, all the letters that he wrote. So what I would like to do is just back up to chapter 1, verse 9, where it begins the sentence. You know, Paul writes these long sentences. It starts in verse 9, comes runs all the way down through the chapter. Matter of fact, Ephesians chapter 1 in the original language is, begins in verse 3, and it doesn't stop till verse 14. That's one sentence. So I, thought, I thought, matter of fact, when I was in an English class, uh, we had to diagram sentences, and uh, the professor said, you know, all right, let's, let's diagram some, we start with simple ones, you know, uh, you know, see, spot, run, you know, okay, and all that kind of stuff. But then now you have a sentence that begins in verse 3 of Ephesians 1, goes down to verse 14. How are you going to diagram that one? I, well, that's, that's a challenge, and uh, I, didn't, I wasn't successful in some of those challenges. So <laughs> I say that only to point out that Paul writes all these long sentences, and this is one of those long sentences here. For this cause we also, this is verse 9, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray and make requests for you that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding to walk worthily of the Lord unto all pleasing, bearing fruit unto every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthen with all power according to the might of his glory unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding. Now verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father who made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light who delivered us out of the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the Son of his love in whom we have our redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. Now here we come to the passage. Now we remove our shoes who is the image of the invisible God. He's talking about Christ, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him were all things created in the heavens and upon the earth, things visible and things invisible, where the thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. All things were created through him and unto him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence, or I believe it was in Brother Dan's translation, the supremacy in all things. That's to what Paul is driving, the supremacy of our Lord and Savior Christ. Now, with that passage in mind, let's look at four different elements that I want to examine for just a moment. We'll look at, first of all, the image of the invisible God that's found in verse 15. Number two... The firstborn of all creation. That's also found in verse 15. Then we go to verse 17. He is before all things, and we'll also look at, and in him all things consist. And then finally, verse 18, he is the head of the body of the church. Then we have this phrase, he is the beginning. So image of the invisible God, firstborn of all creation, before him, he is before all things rather, and then finally, the beginning. So let's think about those elements as we 
plumb through this passage for just a moment. He is the image of the invisible God. The word image comes from a Greek word, which is icon, and it's a word that we get our English word, icon, I-C-O-N. And it means participation. It is not simply resemblance, even though it can be that. It means participation in. It means the true reflection of. What is he a reflection? He's a reflection of God. That's what he's telling us. Illustrative of this is, let's go back to John chapter 14 for just a moment. Here's, here's a scene that is instructive to us because it shows us exactly what not only Paul has in mind here, but what our Lord taught. Let, he tells us, let not your heart be troubled. We'll start in verse 1. By the way, the last night before our Lord was crucified is right here. He's in an upper room with the disciples. The hour is dark. Judas has already left. He's now gone to betray our Lord. And so because of that, in the sober moments, Jesus now says this, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go now to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know the way. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How do we know the way? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Believest thou not that I'm in the Father, and the Father in me? Philip asked him the question, Lord, this is verse 9 now, Lord, show us the Father. And it suffices us. Jesus answers, Have I been with you so long time? Do you not know me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? Here is a statement clearly made pertaining to his deity, his godhoodness. That's exactly what we have, the image of the invisible God. Became visible because he became a man. So there's the first line of Colossians 1 verse 15. The image of the invisible God. Then we have this statement, the firstborn of all creation. What does that mean, the firstborn of all creation? A mistake is made here frequently by different religious organizations who say, tell us that this means he's the first being created. That is not true. That is, that is error. And how do we know? Well, first of all, look at the next line. The first line of verse 16 tells us, as... Proof of that he's the firstborn of all creation. For by him were all things created. He was not himself created. But let's look at that word firstborn for just a moment. The word firstborn is used widespread in the Old Testament to refer to the relationship of Israel to God. And he says that Israel is my firstborn. But it doesn't refer to a created act necessarily. It refers to the idea that he is, or Israel is, heir to the blessings of the Father. That's the idea. And so it is used regarding Israel in the Old Testament. But it became to be used to refer to the Messiah, a messianic title. And so in Psalms 89, verse 27, I will make him my firstborn, the ruler of the kings of the earth. God says, I will make him my firstborn the ruler of the kings of the earth. Here's another text, Hebrews 1 and 6. Here's a passage that tells us about the deity of Christ also. And he tells it in these terms. He's quoting from Psalms 97. When he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. The firstborn is brought into the world. That's Christ when he became a man. Let all the angels of God worship him. That is all, all beings, all angelic beings worship the Father. And not only worship the Father, but worship the Son. And worship is due only to whom? God. Only to God. But here we have angels worshiping him. If in Hebrews 1 you're still, go down to verse 8. Here is a passage quoted from the Psalms, I believe it's 102, 
where he tells us, quoting the psalm, Paul writing, he applies it to Christ, and here's what he says regarding Christ. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the scepter of uprightness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity, therefore God, thy God, has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning didst lay the foundation of the earth. Here's the Father speaking to the Son and says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Deity of Jesus Christ. Remarkable, isn't it? That's what this means, firstborn of all creation. It refers to the fact that he's heir of all things, and it's a statement of his deity, his godhoodness. Now let's notice the next lines, which really are given to build this passage up. And now Paul comes right to the approach of what's the problem, what's bothering the people at Colossae, when he tells us, for by him were all things created. Now he says it this way, listen to this, in the heavens and upon the earth, Things visible, things invisible, then what? Thrones, dominions, principalities, powers. Whatever intermediate beings or angelic forces or demonic forces people might suppose are in the world or may be in the world, Christ created them all. What's the point? The point is there's no need to fear forces behind the scenes. There's no need to fear dark forces of the world when Christ has created them all. That's the point he's making. And these statements are given for our instruction that we might know Christ is the creator. That's what he's given them for. And matter of fact, it's interesting to know the Jews use these phrases, thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, to refer to different grades of angelic forces. No matter what great of angelic force it may be, people are looking at me, wow, I never heard angelic forces, grades of angelic forces. That's what they're using it for. And that's what he's referring to. Christ created them. So why are we interested in using them for intermediary beings or being afraid of dark forces on the other side? Why be afraid of those? Christ created them all. And that's the idea. Now let's go to verse 17. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Two phrases here, before all things, that is primacy, preeminence. Let's look at, as illustrative of this, John 1 and verse 1. Here's truly a great statement also of our Lord's deity. John 1 and 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Without him was not anything made that has been made. That cuts out the idea that Christ is a created being, doesn't it? Let's look at verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. Word was with God. The Word was God. Three phrases, three clauses. In the beginning was. When you go back to the beginning, the beginning point, that is, in the beginning, God created. When you go back to that beginning point, Genesis 1.1, already was existing. No beginning point. Already was existing Christ. Already. And there is no beginning point. It's not a point in time. It's a straight line. It's what we would call just a linear equation that goes infinitely into the future, into the past. Already was existing. So in the beginning was the Word. Then we have the word was with God. The word with in this context and the particular word that is used refers to a face-to-face -face relationship with the Father. Face-to-face, -face, referring to a personality. Someone was with God. Now, if we stop right there, you might suppose, well, there are two gods. <laughs> but no, John brings unity back to that duality in the last clause. The word was God. Not the Father. That's a personality. But the Son. God is a statement of deity. It means divine nature. Christ was divine nature. And we learn in verse 14, this divine nature, God became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld, John says, his glory, even as only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Isn't that a beautiful text? John 1 and 1. But it's good passage to illustrate what we have right here. Here's before all things. And then we have the statement, in him all things consist. I like this word here, consist. 
It's one of those words that brings out a lot of color right here because it means everything adheres, everything is held together. You, you might have a translation that says held together. I don't know if a translation say it that way. All things are held together by Christ. What's he talking about? The universe, everything is held together by Christ. That's what he's talking about. Everything adheres and everything coheres together because of Christ. Thinking about that for just a moment, there was an, a British physicist a century ago by the name of Sir, Jane, uh, Sir James Jean. No, Sir Jean James, that's who it is. <laughs> Sir Jean James. Going to turn his word names around. Sir Jean James, he said, look, he said, Looking at the universe, he says, whatever the creative force of the universe was, if that creative force were to withdraw its power, everything would fall apart. That's exactly the idea. That's exactly the idea. Everything adheres. Christ causes the universe to adhere. Have you ever thought about how the universe is so put together minutely, mechanically, and it all runs smoothly? That power, that force, the creative energy is Christ himself, not simply energy, but a person, and he holds it together still to this day. So same thing is said in Hebrews chapter 1. It tells us there he upholds all things by the word of his power. When our Lord wants to quit, stop it, all it's going to take is his word, and it will stop. It will fall apart. It will be done. So his word upholds all things, and all, in him all things consist, adhere together. Then we have verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church. By the way, why did he put that in there? Well, he put that in there to show us that we, of all people, should honor him as head. He's going to develop that idea later when we get to chapter 2. We, of all people, should honor him as head. So he's the head of the body, the church. That shows us one head, one body. The Bible teaches us one church. Head of the body, the one church. And then he tells us he's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. The word beginning is a Greek word that means the source. He is the source of all things. So not only does he cause everything to adhere together, all things consist in Christ, but he's the source of all things. Can you imagine a greater, more magnificent statement of our Lord than what Paul outlines right here? I cannot. Now you know why I said when you approach it, it's almost like take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground. Now you see why it is important for us to gather and assemble and worship and honor him with our voices, honor him with our talents, our monies, however much or little they may be. This is why. Now before we leave that, I do want to add one note. And I see this phraseology, the firstborn from the dead. See that in verse 18? What is the significance of this? I like the way, once again, Brother Dan's translation read that one because that's how his translation read it is exactly the original. Not simply firstborn from the dead, but firstborn from among the dead ones. That is, there are many people that are dead, gone on to the land beyond, but he's the one who arose from among the dead ones. But here's something else even more interesting. Let's go to Romans chapter 1 for a moment. Romans 1 We'll begin in verse 1. Romans 1. Paul makes a statement here regarding the resurrection of Christ that is also highly instructive. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he promised to fall through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son who is born of the seed of David according to the flesh, who is declared to be the son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. And in this statement, resurrection from the dead, it's almost the same wording as we have right here, but literally it is resurrection of those who are dead. Plural. Now why would he do that? Christ, he's speaking about Christ's resurrection bodily out of the grave, and he casually throws in the resurrection of the dead ones, and he's speaking about Christ's. Now why is that? The resurrection of the dead ones, of the dead people. Well, because 
When Christ was resurrected, according to 1 Corinthians 15, it was the first fruits of the resurrection. That is, his resurrection was a promise of our resurrection, and it's all tied together. When he resurrected from the dead, he promised that we will resurrect also from the dead. That's the idea, Romans 1 and 4. So, all of this given for the last line of verse 18, that in all things he might have supremacy. So the question is, is he supreme in your life? Is he supreme with me? Is he supreme? Thinking about that, let's open it up for a moment to what I call simply a worldview. What is a worldview? A worldview is a vantage point from which I see the movements of history, from which I understand and interpret what's going on in the political and the religious world. A worldview is my vantage point from which I view all of reality. It is a lens through which I see everything from history and current events. That's a worldview. It is a paradigm in which I am going to be able to determine what has occurred in the world and what is now occurring and what will occur. It is a paradigm or it is a lens through which I view world history. That is, world history is not simply things bumping along, just happen chance and happenstance. But these things are orchestrated by God who's behind the scenes, adhering all things together and bringing all things to a purpose. For him are all things, through him and unto him. Remember that statement in Colossians 1? Unto him and for him, that is, for his purpose. He brings all of these things about, whether it is historical movements or the five themes of geography, the movement of people here and there. Remember the five themes of geography, inclusive of all of the movements of history? Movements of people, art, music, literature, whatever science, whatever it may be, whatever field, mathematics, the precisions of it, all of these things we understand because we see it through the lens of Christ as the adhering principle of all of it. He's our worldview. That's the idea. And it gives us the answers to the important questions such as, why am I here? Where am I going? And what's the purpose for me being here? How did I get here? What's my history? How did I get here? Why am I here and where am I going? And what's the purpose of all of this going on in the world today? Only when I can see it through the lens of Christ, the adhering principle, the cohesion of the universe, can I understand some of these things. Now, there are many worldviews from which to choose. You can choose the worldview of skepticism, doesn't believe much of anything, Doubts everything that possibly is. The worldview of evolutionism, saying everything just happened chance, came about bumping along in history. You can view it from hedonism. Hedonism is live life to the fullest. Let's enjoy, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. That's another paradigm. That's another worldview. You can view it from humanism, saying that humans are the focal point of our, of our existence. And so since humans are the focal point, then we better do some things about the environment. We better do things about this and that. That's a lens through which you're viewing things. But the only suitable and adequate worldview is Jesus Christ. That's the only worldview. That he holds everything together and it is ours to honor him and adore him. Several years ago, there was a book written... I take it probably about 20 to 30, actually. And his name, the author's name was Robert Jastrow. Robert Jastrow was, I don't know if he's still living or not, was a world-class astronomer. And he wrote a small book called God and the Astronomers. And he pointed out very interesting things. I think he was taught in the, uh, in the uh, I started to say, the country of Oregon. <laughs> In the state of Oregon, we might need a passport to get there, that's true. <laughs> he taught in Oregon, I think at a university there. 
But he pointed out in God and the astronomers that it used to be a century ago that the viewpoint, the worldview of the science world was what we co they called of the universe, the steady state universe. Well, what's the steady state? It means that the universe has always been, it always will be, it's just no beginning and no end. And it just, it just is. They didn't think about the beginning, they don't think about the cataclysm at the end, they don't think about anything. Steady state. But the evidence began to accumulate at the turn of the 20th century, early 1900s, that the universe had a beginning. And the evidence included what we call now the laws of thermodynamics, that is, everything is winding down, wearing out. They began to see that. The scientists began to see that, no, it's all, it's all winding down and wearing out. That posited the idea that there was a beginning point. Not only so, so but the red shift of the stars, that is, that showed that there was, there was the movement of the galaxies and the stars that showed that it had a beginning point somehow. But the reason that he brought all of this up was because he said that it's a very strange thing in the world of science to hear the responses of those unbelievers in science, such as Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein, when he saw the evidence, began to accumulate that there was not a steady state theory, but that there was a beginning point. He said, it is repugnant to me. Repugnant. Why? What difference would it make? Think about that for a moment. When Arthur Eddington, who was the world-class astronomer from England, saw the same thing, he said, it leaves me cold. I don't want to believe it. Why? I'll tell you why. Because if there's a beginning point, someone had to begin it. And there's also an ending point. And it's not simply just here, and we don't have any reason to, to explain it. It's here, and it had a beginning point. And they saw that, and they recognized that somehow, some way, an explanation for the beginning point was needed. And they didn't like that because it implied God. One other book I want to mention. His name was Paul Davies. I got the name right this time. Paul Davies. He wrote a book 20 years ago called The Mind of God. He was a physicist. And he said, when all of this evidence, and he's writing about the, same, about the same proof that there was a beginning point of the universe, and it's going down to a conclusion, he said, the only thing that we can conclude is that we must find an explanation of the universe outside the universe itself. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. The explanation for the universe is not found in the universe. It's found outside the universe. It's found in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the principle not only of its adherence. He is the creator of all things. And he's the one whom we should adore and honor and respect and worship. So that's what we're doing. And that's what the book of Colossians is all about. If you're not a New Testament Christian, now's the time to make it right with God by belief Repentance, baptism into Christ, God puts you into his family. If you've been an unfaithful Christian, now's the time you can make it right. If you want us to pray with you, for you, we can do that. If you'll come to the front while we stand and sing, we'll assist you if you have need of anything at all.